QB uh, seminar. I'm Stephen Burley, the founding director of the Institute for Quantitative Bio. I'm uh, delighted to be uh, be hosting um, one of our own, uh, Richard E. Bright uh, from Rutgers University today. Uh, before I introduce Richard, just a couple of um, uh, announcements. There are um, uh, Alternating on the screen is advertising for the special symposium celebrating the 50th anniversary of the founding of the Protein Data Bank back in 1971. Uh, I urge you all to register uh, for the May 4 5 online uh, event, which includes uh, some of the top structural biologists uh, in the world and uh, an opportunity to uh, join with the PDB teams from uh, Japan, uh, Europe, and the United States in celebrating. Uh, uh, the um, success of the first open access digital data resource in all of biology. Uh, you can be part of that success more directly uh, if you um, have an interest in becoming either a scientific software developer or a postdoctoral fellow um, at either Rutgers or UCSD, uh, two of the three performance sites for the RCSB Protein Data Bank, the third being at uh, UCSF. So currently there are positions available for developers at both Rutgers and UCSD and a postdoctoral opening at, uh, at UCSD and uh, applications from uh, within the Rutgers community are, um, uh, are welcome. So Ken, if you could switch to Dr. Ebright's first slide, please. Thank you very much, Richard. So it, as I said, it's, uh, it's a pleasure and indeed an honor to be uh, hosting uh, Professor Richard Ebright uh, here today. Uh, he's a Board of Governors Professor of Chemistry and Chemical Biology uh, in, the, um, in that department and Laboratory Director at the Waxman Institute of uh, Microbiology. He runs a lab of uh, 15 and serves as a project leader on two NIH research grants. His uh, research is focused on the structure, mechanism, and regulation of bacterial transcription complexes and on development of inhibitors of bacterial transcription as anti-tuberculosis agents and broad-spectrum antibacterial agents. He uses structural biology, biophysics, uh, and drug discovery uh, in his uh, day-to-day his -day life. Uh, Richard uh, graduated summa from uh, Harvard in uh, biology and then went on to receive his uh, PhD in microbiology and molecular genetics, uh, also at uh, Harvard University uh, and uh, with some uh, work at uh, Institute Pasteur as a junior fellow of the Harvard University Society of Fellows. Rutgers was very fortunate to uh, recruit him in 1987 after he finished his uh, his work at the Pasteur, and he you know, quick, very quickly rose through the ranks uh, at, uh, at Rutgers, and as I said, is now a Board of Governors professor. He's received numerous awards, including the uh, Searle Scholar Award, the Sharing Plow Award, uh, and NIH Merit Award. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Association for Advancement of Science, the American Academy of Microbiology and Infectious Diseases, and the Infectious Diseases Society of America. Uh, he's also been uh, done a lot of uh, uh, public service as a scientist, including a 16 year stint as an editor of the Journal of Molecular Biology. Uh, and he's been um, very much involved in uh, concerns for uh, molecular uh, biology safety and uh, is a member of the Institutional Biosafety Committee of Rutgers and the um, Antimicrobial Resistance Committee of the Infectious Disease Society of America, and has been a member of the Working Group on Pathogen Security for the state of New Jersey and con the Controlling Dangerous Pathogens Project of the Center for International Studies. Uh, Richard is a scholar uh, and uh, you will see from the work that he is going to present today on the structural basis of transcription and translation, uh, one who is not, of a, not afraid of tackling very challenging problems. Uh, I would argue that this uh, work that Richard's going to describe that was uh, appeared in, uh, in science in uh, late last year uh, represents one of the uh, most important discoveries in structural biology uh, over the over the last year, and uh, we're very fortunate today to have Richard uh, 
uh, tell us all about it and uh, set the stage for his next successes. So thank you, Richard. Thank you very much, Steve. So the topic of my presentation today is the structural basis of transcription translation coupling. And the work that I'll be presenting today is work that was performed in my laboratory at Rutgers University, uh, done by Cheng Yuan Wang and Vadim Malotsov, two outstanding research associates, and was performed in collaboration with Jason Keller and his colleagues at the Cryo EM Cryo ET facility here at Rutgers, Gregor Blaha at the University of California, Riverside, and Min Su at the University of Michigan. And as you've just heard from Steve, much of the work that I'll present today was uh, reported in September in a paper in Science. In bacteria, transcription and translation occur in the same cellular compartment. There is no nuclear envelope separating the expression of genes in the nucleus from translation outside the nucleus. So transcription and translation occur in the same cellular compartment, and they occur at the same time. In most bacterial species, including the standard model organism, Escherichia coli, transcription and translation are coordinated processes in which the rate of transcription by a molecule of RNA polymerase, or NAP, synthesizing a messenger RNA molecule, is coordinated with the rate of translation by the first ribosome, the lead ribosome, translating that messenger RNA molecule. The evidence for transcription translation coupling in E. coli is compelling. Classic EM images, so-called Miller spreads of E. coli, show same compartment, same time, coordinated transcription and translation, with RNA polymerase essentially always remaining in contact with the lead ribosome. You see here a representative Miller spread with the DNA of a gene running from left to right here, and with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight molecules of RNA polymerase transcribing that gene, producing RNA molecules of progressively greater length as the RNA polymerases move through the gene from left to right. In each one of these RNA molecules being transcribed by the RNA polymerase, there are large black density features these are ribosomes translating the RNA molecule as it is being transcribed. And crucially, for each one of the small gray density features that is assigned as RNA polymerase, there is a ribosome immediately adjacent to that RNA polymerase. So these Miller spreads show that essentially always in E. coli, an RNA polymerase molecule and the lead ribosome move in unison. In addition, transcription and translation in E. coli are kinetically coordinated. If one artificially increases or decreases the rate of transcription, one sees corresponding increases or decreases in the rate of translation. Conversely, if one artificially increases or decreases the rate of translation, one sees corresponding increases and decreases in the rate of transcription. In addition, transcription and translation in E. coli are functionally coordinated. A ribosome can rescue a paused or arrested RNA polymerase molecule by pushing it forward, and an RNA polymerase molecule can rescue a paused or arrested ribosome by pulling it forward. I don't like that error message. Uh, I will reopen the file. Uh, this is unfortunate. Bear with me. Oh. Okay, is my screen currently shared? 
no. assuming the answer is no. Okay, so this is where we were. I apologize. We continue. Okay. So extensive genetic and biochemical evidence indicates that transcription translation coupling in E. coli is mediated by transcription elongation factors of the NUSG RFAH protein family. NUSG serves as a universal coupling factor. NUSG couples transcription and translation at essentially every gene in E. coli. The NUSG homolog RFAH is a specialized regulon specific coupling factor. RFAH couples transcription and translation at a subset of genes that contain a specific DNA sequence required for RFAH to load onto RNA polymerase. NUSG and RFAH each consists of two domains and a flexible linker. Each of these has an N terminal domain that interacts with RNA polymerase and each of these has a C-terminal domain that interacts with ribosomal protein S10. And it has been hypothesized that NUSG and RFAH serve as a bridge. Each serves as a bridge, bridging RNA polymerase and the ribosome with its N-terminal domain interacting with RNA polymerase and the C-terminal domain interacting simultaneously with ribosomal protein S10 displayed on the surface of the ribosome. In addition, genetic and biochemical evidence indicates that transcription translation coupling in E. coli is modulated by a second transcription elongation factor, NUSA. In 2017, Patrick Kramer and his co-workers reported a low-resolution cryo-EM structure of an E. coli transcription translation complex, which they termed the Expresso. Uh, suggesting that this is the complex responsible for expressing genetic information in DNA and carrying out the uh, core molecular biology processes of transcription and translation concurrently. They obtained this complex by halting a transcribing RNA polymerase and allowing a translating ribosome to collide with the halted RNA polymerase. But, the messenger RNA molecule in their structure was not fully resolved, making it impossible to determine the length of the messenger RNA spacer between RNA polymerase and the ribosome active center. And even more important, the functional relevance of the structure has been challenged. It has been challenged because the structure was generated as a collision complex, not as a bona fide coupled transcription translation complex. And it has been challenged because the structure is incompatible with the simultaneous interaction of NUSG N terminal domain with RNA polymerase and NUSG C terminal domain with the ribosome, and thus incompatible with the proposed and expected bridging by NUSG of RNA polymerase and ribosome. Our objective was to revisit the structural biology of transcription and translation coupling. To do this, we obtained high resolution structures of E. coli transcription translation complexes, which we call TTCs, that contained defined length, known length, messenger RNA spacers between RNA polymerase and the ribosome. And we obtained these structures both in the presence and in the absence of the coupling factors, namely NUSG and or NUSA. In this work, we prepared and analyzed a set of seven synthetic nucleic acid scaffolds. The sequences of the seven synthetic nucleic acid scaffolds are shown at the bottom of the slide. Each scaffold contained two DNA oligonucleotides shown in black, and each scaffold contained one RNA oligonucleotide selected from the set of seven RNA oligonucleotides shown in red. Each scaffold contained DNA and messenger RNA determinants that direct formation of a transcription elongation complex, a TEC, upon addition of RNA polymerase. These determinants consist of the two strands of DNA, the DNA oligonucleotides serving as a DNA non-template strand and a DNA template strand for transcription with a nine 
base pair non-complementary region mimicking the unwound transcription bubble that occurs in a transcription elongation complex inside the RNA polymerase active center cleft. The mRNA determinants were the same for the mRNA determinants that direct formation of a transcription elongation complex were the same in each of the seven RNA oligonucleotides. They correspond to the 14 C terminal nucleotides of the oligonucleotide. The nine uh, the nine three prime nucleotides are designed to base pair to the template strand of DNA of the transcription bubble in the active center cleft of the transcribing RNA polymerase. And five additional nucleotides are designed to pass out from the active center of RNA polymerase to the exterior of RNA polymerase, passing through the RNA polymerase RNA exit channel. The dashed line denotes the boundary of the transcription elongation complex that will be formed with these nucleic acid scaffolds. It denotes essentially the molecular envelope of RNA polymerase on the nucleic acids. Each of the scaffolds also contained a messenger RNA determinant, namely a translation start codon, AUG, that directs formation of a translation complex upon addition of a ribosome and an initiator tRNA. You see here the translation start code on AUG present in each of the RNA oligonucleotides. And you see the dashed lines that mark the position of the ribosome active center peptidyl site or product site, which will together with the initiator tRNA engage this AUG sequence. Finally, each of the scaffolds contained a messenger RNA spacer having a different length. You see the spacers, the uh, seven oligonucleotides had spacers of four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, or 10 codons. So having prepared seven different synthetic nucleic acid scaffolds for each scaffold, we then added RNA polymerase to form a transcription elongation complex then added ribosome and initiator tRNA to form a translation complex, and optionally also added NUSG and or NUSA. We then determined the structure of the resulting complexes, the resulting transcription translation complexes by use of single particle reconstruction cryo-EM. We obtained in this way structures of two different classes of molecular assemblies, which we designate TTCA and TTCB. With nucleic acid scaffolds that had short messenger RNA spacers, spacers of four, five, six, seven, or eight codons, we obtained structures that matched the previously reported Expresso, and we designate those structures TTCA and you see a structure of TTCA boxed at left. In contrast with nucleic acid scaffolds having longer messenger RNA spacers, spacers of eight, nine, or 10 codons, we obtained structures of a new different molecular assembly that has features that indicate that it is the molecular assembly that functionally mediates NUSG dependent NUSA dependent transcription translation coupling in E. coli. And we call this assembly TTCB. And you see structures of TTCB boxed at right. We obtain structures of TTCB in the presence of NUSG, showing NUSG bridging RNA polymerase and the ribosome. And we also obtain structures of TTCB in the presence of both NUSA and NUSG, with NUSG and NUSA both bridging. RNA polymerase and the ribosome. I'll discuss each of these two classes of molecular assemblies in turn, starting with TTCA. Here we see the structure of TTCA at left in the same view orientation as in the preceding slide, and at right in a view orientation rotated by 90 degrees on the vertical axis. The structure shows RNA polymerase at top, transcribing the DNA and producing a messenger RNA molecule. The ribosome 30S subunit in yellow below and the ribosome 50S subunit in gray further below. And the structures show 
to transfer RNAs to tRNAs in the ribosome active center with the tRNA shown in green and orange. Crucially, the messenger RNA, the messenger RNA being transcribed by the RNA polymerase is being translated by the ribosome. The nine nucleotides at the three prime end of the messenger RNA are engaged in base pairs with the DNA template strand as an RNA-DNA hybrid inside the RNA polymerase active center cleft. Additional nucleotides of RNA then leave RNA polymerase through the RNA polymerase RNA exit channel and enter the ribosome through the ribosome messenger RNA entrance portal. After entering the ribosome, the RNA passes through the 30S subunit of the ribosome to the active center of the ribosome where the AUG start codon, the translation start codon, at its five prime end base pairs to the anticodon of the initiator tRNA in the ribosome active center P site. We obtain structures of TTCA, as I've mentioned, with nucleic acid scaffolds having messenger RNA spacers of four, five, six, seven, or eight codons. And the particular structure that's illustrated here has a spacer of four codons and a resolution of 3.7 angstroms. The structures of TTCA obtained with nucleic acid scaffolds having messenger RNA spacers of four, five, six, seven, and eight are in overall structure the same. Thus, when superimposed in all of these structures, the orientation of RNA polymerase relative to the ribosome is the same. This is despite the fact, again, that these structures have messenger RNA spacers of four, five, six, seven, or eight codons. The difference in the messenger RNA spacer length is accommodated uh, through differences in the extent of compaction of messenger RNA inside RNA polymerase in the RNA polymerase RNA exit channel and the RNA polymerase ribosome interface. So looking here, we're seeing uh, the experimental density and fit uh, for the messenger RNA. You have here the three prime end of the messenger RNA interacting with the RNA polymerase active center catalytic site indicated by a purple sphere. Nine nucleotides of the RNA are engaged in base pairing with the DNA template strand as an RNA-DNA hybrid in the RNA polymerase active center cleft. Additional nucleotides then pass out of RNA polymerase through the RNA polymerase RNA exit channel, pass across the interface between RNA polymerase and the ribosome, enter the ribosome, and proceed through the ribosome to reach the active center of the ribosome where the AUG translation start codon base pairs to the initiator tRNA in the ribosome active center P site. As one increases the length of the messenger RNA spacer from four codons to five codons and then to six codons, the additional first codon in this case and the additional first and second codon in this case are accommodated by compacting the DNA here and here in the RNA polymerase RNA exit channel and in the RNA polymerase ribosome interface. The compaction involves bending the DNA acutely at several points when one introduces one additional codon and bending the DNA even more acutely and at even more points as one introduces the second codon of additional space. As one increases the spacer length to seven codons or to eight codons, again, the additional RNA nucleotides are accommodated in the same places, the RNA polymerase the RNA exit channel and the RNA polymerase ribosome interface. In this case, the additional nucleotides are, the nucleotides in those regions are disordered, indicating that uh, there are, uh, there is an ensemble of distinct conformations, distinct ways that this DNA, this RNA is compacted in this region. The volume of the RNA polymerase RNA exit channel, this volume, limits the maximum the maximum messenger RNA spacer length to eight codons. And this immediately explains our observation that TTCA is formed only with short messenger RNA spacers, namely only with messenger RNA spacer lengths less than or eight 
less than or equal to eight codons. With short mRNA spacers, the RNA can be accommodated without disrupting the interface of TTCA with more than eight nucleotides. The volume that could accommodate the RNA is filled to capacity and one must disrupt the interface between RNA polymerase and the ribosome that's present in TTCA. In TTCA, the RNA polymerase ribosome interface is extensive. There are approximately 4,000 square angstroms of buried surface area. And the interface involves contacts of the RNA polymerase beta prime zinc binding domain in pink, the RNA polymerase beta flap in cyan, and the RNA polymerase alpha-1 subunit in green with ribosomal proteins S4, S3, and S10, respectively. And each one of these ribosomal proteins is displayed on the exterior surface of the 30S subunit of the ribosome. Our high resolution structure of TTCA shows that TTCA is incompatible with NUSG bridging, the NUSG bridging that had been proposed based on genetic and biochemical experiments. We are able to obtain structures of NUSG both in the absence, sorry, obtain structures of TTCA both in the absence of NUSG and in the presence of NUSG. And the orientation of RNA polymerase relative to the ribosome is identical in the absence or presence of NUSG. When NUSG is present, the NUSG N terminal domain is observed in the cryoEA maps in the expected location interacting with the RNA polymerase here but the NUSG N terminal domain is on the opposite face of RNA polymerase, the opposite side relative to its target within the ribosome, namely ribosomal protein S10. And the distance between the binding site for NUSG N terminal domain and the binding site for NUSG C terminal domain is more than 160 angstroms, a distance that cannot be bridged by NUSG cannot be bridged by the flexible linker between the domains of NUSG. The structure of TTCA does not permit NUSG bridging. Our structure of TTCA also indicates that TTCA is incompatible with binding of the second transcription elongation factor thought to modulate coupling NUSA. We have obtained structures of TTCA both in the absence of NUSA and in the presence of NUSA. And in both cases, NUSA is not included in the complex. So if we prepare complexes without NUSA, or if we prepare complexes with NUSA, we obtain only TTCA complexes without NUSA. And if we attempt to model the binding of NUSA into the complex by positioning NUSA at its expected binding site on RNA polymerase, we would see essentially complete, essentially total steric clash between NUSA and the ribosome. So these features of TTCA suggest that TTCA is unlikely to be involved in functional transcription translation coupling. The structure of TTCA also reveals additional incompatibilities with other known aspects of transcription. Thus, TTCA is incompatible with formation of pause or termination RNA hairpins. It is well established that secondary structures formed in the RNA emerging from RNA polymerase cause RNA polymerase to pause or to terminate transcription. The structure of TTCA does not permit the formation of those pause and termination hairpins. If we attempt to build them into their expected binding location relative to RNA polymerase, they clash essentially totally with the ribosome in TTCA. TTCA, TTCA also is incompatible with binding of transcription anti-termination factors, which are regulatory factors that bind to RNA polymerase and prevent the recognition of termination signals, transcription stop signals. If we attempt to build the structure of a transcription anti-termination factor, Q21 anti-terminator, uh, onto its expected binding location on RNA polymerase, in the context of TTCA, it would clash essentially totally with the ribosome. Indeed, in TTCA, even RNA polymerase structure is incompatible. Thus, uh, in TTCA, the RNA polymerase, one of the RNA polymerase subunits, the RNA polymerase omega subunit, is absent or disordered. There is no density in our maps for the RNA polymerase omega subunit. And if we attempt to build the RNA polymerase omega subunit into its expected binding location on RNA polymerase, it would severely clash with the ribosome. 
In addition to that, our structures reveal that TTCA is incompatible with known aspects of translation. It is established that in each ribosome translocation step in translation, part of the ribosome 30S subunit, called the ribosome 30S head, part shown in brown, rotates by about 20 degrees relative to the ribosome 30S body, part of the 30S subunit shown in yellow. And this rotation of the 30S head relative to the body is believed to be essential for translocation and essential for accommodation of incoming tRNAs for extension of the protein chain by a ribosome. This process is called 30S head swiveling. In our structures of TTCA, the RNA polymerase ribosome interface spans both the 30S head and the 30S body. And because it spans both the head and the body, it would be expected to prevent the swiveling by trapping the ribosome in its unswiveling state, in its unswiveled state, preventing the swiveling and therefore preventing translocation and tRNA accommodation. So taken together, we see that TTCA is incompatible with binding of the expected coupling factor, NUSG, incompatible with binding of the expected coupling factor, NUSA, incompatible with other known functional aspects of transcription, and incompatible with known functional aspects of translation. From this, we conclude that TTCA does not mediate general transcription translation coupling. And we infer that TTCA is an anomalous complex, an anomalous complex that's formed only when the messenger RNA spacer between RNA polymerase and the ribosome is anomalously short. So we conclude that it is a collisionome or a crashome or a collided expressome. It is not the expressome, not the functional assembly that mediates functional transcription, translation, and coupling in E. coli. We turn now to TTCB. Uh, you see here TTCB in the same two view orientations shown previously for TTCA. We obtain structures of TTCB with nucleic acid scaffolds having messenger RNA spacers of eight, nine, or 10 codons in length. And the structure that's illustrated here has a messenger RNA spacer of nine codons and a resolution of 4.7 angstroms. If we compare the structure of TTCA here at left to the structure of TTCB here at right, it's clear that the position of RNA polymerase is different. There is a 70 angstrom translation of RNA polymerase from its position in TTCA to its position in TTCB. In TTCA, the RNA polymerase is located approximately over the center of the 30S subunit. In TTCB, it is translated 70 angstroms to the right and is now at the right edge of the 30S subunit. In addition, the two assemblies differ by a 180 degree rotation of RNA polymerase. That rotation occurs about an axis that would be roughly in the plane of the screen on the diagonal. Because the position of RNA polymerase relative to the 30S subunit is different in TTCA and in TTCB, the coupling of the RNA exit channel of RNA polymerase to the messenger RNA entrance portal of the ribosome is different in TTCA versus in TTCB. In TTCA, the RNA polymerase RNA exit channel is coupled directly to the ribosome messenger RNA entrance portal here and here. In contrast, in TTCB, the RNA polymerase RNA exit channel here is separated by about 70 angstroms from the ribosome uh, messenger RNA entrance portal here. Thus, in TTCB, there is a 70 angstrom long, thus 12 nucleotide long messenger RNA segment, this messenger RNA segment, circled in black, that connects the RNA polymerase RNA exit channel to the ribosome messenger RNA entry portal. And the, this segment, this approximately 70 angstrom long, approximately 12 nucleotide long messenger RNA segment, runs along the surface of the ribosome 30S uh, head here, interacting as it does so with the ribosomal protein S3 and making favorable
favorable electrostatic interactions with a series of positively charged amino acids of ribosomal protein S3, all shown as orange spheres. The requirement for this additional 70 angstrom long, 12 nucleotide long messenger RNA segment explains immediately the fact that TTCB is obtained only with nucleic acid scaffolds having longer messenger RNA spacers. It can be formed, such TTCB can be formed only when the messenger RNA spacer length is greater than or equal to eight codons and thus long enough to span this additional distance. In structures of TTCB obtained with nucleic acid scaffolds having messenger RNA spacers of eight, nine, or 10 nucleotides, the orientation of RNA polymerase to the ribosome is the same. Thus, when superimposed, we see the orientations are the same. In TTCB, just as I showed you previously in TTCA, the differences in messenger RNA spacer length are accommodated through differences in extensive compaction of messenger RNA in the RNA polymerase RNA exit channel. Thus, when the spacer is eight codons or nine codons or 10 codons, in each case, the differences in spacer length are accommodated in the RNA polymerase RNA exit channel, shown here in the outline with the black dash black dashed oval, and in each case, the nucleotides in the RNA polymerase RNA exit channel are segmentally disordered, indicating that they adopt an ensemble of distinct conformations. The volume of this channel, the volume of the RNA polymerase RNA exit channel, sets a limit on the maximum messenger RNA spacer length that can be accommodated within TTCB. And it sets that maximum at 10 to 11 codons, suggesting that TTCB can be formed only with nucleic acid scaffolds that have mRNA spacer lengths that are less than or equal to 10 to 11 codons. And we've been able to validate that by obtaining structures with longer mRNA spacers and seeing that TTCB only can be formed when the spacer is just right. If it's too short, one sees TTCA. If it's too long, one does not see TTCA, TTCB either. In TTCB, the RNA polymerase ribosome interface is small. There's just 200 square angstroms of buried surface area. And the interface involves contacts of the RNA polymerase beta prime zinc binding domain, this module shown here in pink, with ribosomal protein S3 shown here in orange. So there is an interaction between RNA polymerase and the ribosome in TTCB, but it is very small. This small interaction between RNA polymerase and the ribosome is supplemented by a large interaction mediated by NUSG, the coupling factor. In TTCB, NUSG bridges RNA polymerase and the ribosome. The NUSG N terminal domain binds to the RNA polymerase beta prime and beta subunits at its expected binding site. And the NUSG C terminal domain binds simultaneously to ribosomal protein S10 located in the ribosome 30S head here. And the NUSG flexible linker connects the NUSG N terminal domain and the NUSG C terminal domain. And we observe density for the linker and at a lower contour level, observe unambiguous density for each and every residue of the linker. The results thus show unequivocally that NUSG bridges RNA polymerase and the ribosome in the manner that was proposed based on genetics and biochemistry in the context of TTCB. We have been able to show further that NUSG is functionally essential for TTCB formation. In parallel analyses in which we prepare the complexes either without NUSG or with NUSG, we find that without NUSG, no TTCB is obtained. So forming this new assembly TTCB absolutely requires NUSG. And that's unsurprising because most of the buried surface area in the interface is coming from the NUSG bridging, not from RNA polymerase itself. We've obtained structures of TTCB also in the presence of both NUSG and NUSA. We've obtained such structures with nucleic acid scaffolds having messenger RNA spacers of eight, nine, or 10 codons. The structure that's illustrated has a spacer of eight codons and a resolution of 3.5 angstroms. In these structures, we see NUSG 
bridging RNA polymerase and ribosome, NUS G in red, and we see on the opposite face of RNA polymerase, NUS A simultaneously bridging RNA polymerase and ribosome, NUS A shown in blue. I've just said that, NUS A binds to the face of RNA polymerase, opposite to NUS G and forms a second bridge. We have been able to show that NUS A functionally contributes to TTCB formation. In our work, we prepared samples in parallel without NUS A and with NUS A. And we find that without NUS A, substantially less TTCB is obtained as compared to with NUS A. So NUS A is functionally contributing to formation of TTCB when it is making this bridging interaction. In TTCB, NUS A forms a large open rectangular frame that connects RNA polymerase to the ribosome. You see here the large open rectangular frame in blue, this diamond shape in blue. In TTCB, three corners of the NUS A rectangular frame interact with RNA polymerase. One corner interacts with the RNA polymerase alpha subunit C terminal domain one. A second corner interacts with RNA polymerase alpha subunit C terminal domain two. And a third corner interacts with the RNA polymerase beta flap tip helix in cyan here. So three corners of this rectangle interact with modules of RNA polymerase. The remaining corner, the fourth corner of the NUSA rectangular frame interacts with the ribosome here, interacting with ribosomal proteins S2 and S5, which are located in the ribosome 30S body. The NUSA rectangular frame contains a known internal flexible linkage, the AR1-AR2 linker which has been shown previously to allow free movement of AR2 relative to the rest of NUS A. And this rectangular frame interacts with RNA polymerase through three flexibly linked modules, namely alpha C terminal domain one and alpha C terminal domain two, which are known to be connected to the rest of RNA polymerase through long flexible linkers. Those flexible linkers are denoted by these black bars. And the beta flap tip helix, which is known to be connected to the rest of RNA polymerase through flexible connectors circled here in gray. The internal flexible linker in NUS A and the flexible connections that NUS A makes with RNA polymerase enable NUS A to maintain constant contact, constant orientation of contact with the ribosome 30S body, despite differences in orientation of RNA polymerase relative to the ribosome 30S body. Indeed, in our cryo-EM maps, we identify three distinct subclasses of TTCB, which we designate as B1, B2, and B3. In these subclasses, the orientation of RNA polymerase relative to the ribosome is different. RNA polymerase rotates by rotations of 10 to 30 degrees relative to the ribosome 30S subunit. These Differences in the rotational orientation of, of RNA polymerase are accommodated by flexing the internal flexible linker and flexible connections that NUS A makes with RNA polymerase. This is shown more clearly in a video clip. This video clip starts with structural state B1 and shows the rotation of RNA polymerase relative to the ribosome and remarkable flexure of NUS A to yield state B2, and the further rotation of RNA polymerase relative to the ribosome and flexure of NUS A to form state B3. So you have remarkable flexibility in the system with RNA polymerase able to rotate relative to the ribosome and that rotation being accommodated by the internal flexibility in NUS A and the flexible connections that NUS A makes with RNA polymerase. We refer to the NUS A flexible open rectangular frame, this flexible diamond shape, shape feature, as the coupling pantograph, analogizing it to an electric railway coupling pantograph. This rectangular open frame, this flexible diamond shaped feature. 
uh, which is the, as I said, flexible open rectangular frame that enables a locomotive to maintain constant contact with a power cable, despite differences in orientation of the locomotive relative to the cable. Thus, the NUS A diamond shape flexible diamond shaped feature enables NUS A to maintain constant contact with the 30S subunit of the ribosome despite differences in orientation of RNA polymerase relative to the ribosome in much the same manner that the coupling pantograph on a railway locomotive, this flexible diamond shaped feature enables constant connection, constant contact with the power cable despite differences in orientation of the locomotive relative to the cable. Our structure of TTCB shows that it is compatible with known aspects of transcription. Thus, it is fully compatible with formation of pause or termination RNA hairpins if we build them into the structure of TTCB at their expected location relative to TCCB, they can be accommodated without steric clash. We furthermore have demonstrated this directly by obtaining a structure of TTCB with an RNA oligonucleotide with a nucleic acid scaffold containing a messenger RNA designed to form a pause termination and observing the pause uh, to form a pause hairpin and observing the pause hairpin at the expected location. TTCB also is compatible with binding of transcription anti-termination Q21. Uh, if one models anti-terminator Q21 in its expected location relative to RNA polymerase, it can be accommodated without steric clash. And all RNA polymerase subunits are present and ordered in TTCB. TTCB also is compatible with known aspects of translation. So in TTCB, all the RNA polymerase ribosome and NUSG ribosome interactions involve the ribosome 30S head. See the interactions are made with the 30S head in brown and do not extend to the 30S body in yellow. Accordingly, 30S head swiveling, that movement of the 30S head relative to the 30S body that's required in every step of ribosome translocation and every step of ribosome tRNA accommodation can be accommodated by rotating RNA polymerase and NUSG with the 30S head as shown here, as modeled here in a video, showing the 30S head swiveling in translation, RNA polymerase and NUSG swiveling with it. In those TTCB complexes that also contain NUSA, the NUSA ribosome interactions involve the ribosome 30S body, as shown here. Thus, in a NUSA containing TTCB, the complex spans both the 30S head and the 30S body, nevertheless exploiting the remarkable flexibility of the NUSA coupling pantograph, 30S head swiveling can be accommodated by rotating RNA polymerase and NUSG with 30S head and simply flexing the NUSA coupling pantograph. That's shown here with model movement of RNA polymerase and NUSG with the ribosome 30S head and flexing of NUSA to accommodate that movement. So, Taken together, our results indicate that TTCB is compatible with and is functionally stabilized by NUSG bridging. Our results indicate that TTCB is compatible with and functionally stabilized by NUSA bridging. TTCB is compatible with other known functional aspects of transcription. TTCB is compatible with known functional aspects of translation. We conclude that TTCB is a functional complex that mediates NUSG dependent, NUSA dependent, transcription translation coupling. In overall summary, our results provide high resolution structures of the previously described expresso, which we term TTCA, that demonstrate the incompatibility of the previously described expresso with general transcription translation coupling. And the results provide high resolution structures of a new different structural state TTCB that has properties assignable to functional, general, NUSG dependent, NUSA dependent transcription translation coupling. NUSG stabilizes this new state TTCB by bridging RNA polymerase in the ribosome 30S head. NUSA stabilizes this new state TTCB by bridging RNA polymerase and the ribosome 30S body. And NUSA serves as a coupling pantograph that bridges RNA polymerase in the ribosome 30S body in a flexible manner that allows rotation of RNA polymerase relative to the ribosome 30S body. 
in current work involving structural biology, we are now conducting an analysis of transcription translation coupling by the specialized NUSG homolog RFAH. In the introduction, I mentioned that RFAH is a specialized NUSG homolog that serves to mediate coupling at a small subset of genes in E. coli, genes that contain a specific DNA sequence that enables RFAH to load onto RNA polymerase. We have determined structures of transcription translation complexes coupled by RFAH, both with and without the specific loading sequence uh, for a series of mRNA spacers and obtain results that are substantially identical to the results that I've just shown you for NUSG. So the NUSG homolog RFAH functions like NUSG. It bridges RNA polymerase and ribosome, and it bridges in approximately the same range of mRNA spacer lengths. It's able to bridge while bound specifically to the DNA site at which it loads, and it's able to maintain that bridging after leaving that DNA site as RNA polymerase and ribosome continue through the rest of gene expression on the gene. In a second project, we are analyzing transcription translation coupling. Uh, oh, I'm surprised that this is the slide, but uh, analysis of transcription translation coupling quality control by the termination factor rho. So in E. coli, NUSG serves two purposes. It serves the purpose of coupling RNA polymerase in the ribosome, and it also serves the purpose of recruiting a transcription termination factor called rho when coupling between RNA polymerase and the ribosome is lost. So you've already seen from this talk how NUSG mediates transcription translation coupling. It bridges RNA polymerase in the ribosome. If that coupling is disrupted for any reason and TTCB no longer can be formed, the NUSG C terminal domain, the domain that normally would interact with the ribosome in TTCB, is now released. It then binds to, recruits, and induces a conformation change in termination factor rho that causes transcription termination factor rho to bind to the messenger RNA to encircle the messenger RNA, and then, uh, with the hydrolysis of ATP, to disassemble the transcription elongation complex. We have obtained first structures, first high-resolution structures of NUSG bound to rho coupled to the transcription elongation complex in this state where rho is engaged with the messenger RNA, encircling the messenger RNA and poised to disassemble the transcription elongation complex. This defines the basis of what's called transcription translation coupling quality control, because this is the mechanism the cell uses to disassemble a non-functional complex, a complex where the desired, usually present transcription translation coupling is disrupted. In a third project, we're analyzing transcription translation coupling in the other taxon of life in which transcription and translation occur in the same compartment at the same time, namely in archaea. And we've obtained first structures showing that the archaeal homolog of NUSG bridges the archaeal RNA polymerase and the archaeal ribosome. In other current work, this time involving molecular biology, we're seeking to determine whether the RNA polymerase ribosome, NUSG ribosome, and NUSA ribosome interactions that we observe in our structures of TTCA and TTCB also occur in living cells. And we're doing that using approaches that involve unnatural amino acid mutagenesis uh, and in vivo photocrosslinking. We also are analyzing the functional consequences of disrupting those interactions for their effects on transcription in living cells. And we are doing this by use of mutagenesis, followed with deep sequencing methods that enable us to analyze positions of RNA polymerase on the genome. And finally, we are analyzing functional consequences of disrupting the interactions that we see in our structures for their effects on translation in living cells. And we are doing that by mutagenesis, followed by application of sequencing methods that enable us to define the positions of ribosomes and their interactions with RNA polymerase molecules across the E. coli genome. So thank you for your attention, and I would be happy to address any questions. 
Thank you very much, Richard. That was spectacular. We do have time for a few questions with Richard before we, we take a break and uh, meet with the students. So uh, I'll check the chat. Hey, Richard, can you hear me? Yes. Okay? I have a question. This is uh, Jeff Boyd. So in your structures, you show an assembled 70S ribosome. And I'm wondering, you know, what effect might a different initiation factors, like initiation factor A, for instance, have on the structure in the assembly of this holo complex this, um, that you're showing? So we have only looked at an intact 70S assembled by reconstitution with an initiator tRNA. We have not looked at any level biochemically or structurally at the more complex path that is used in cells for translation initiation that involves assembly of the ribosome on the tRNA site with initiation factors. So we have no information on that. So just like a really quick follow-up, I was really intrigued by your comment that the ribosome can kind of um, essentially pull along the polymerase. A push, so the ribosome pushes the polymerase pulls. I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah. I, I got you. I got you. So then if you have, uh, if they can't effectively assemble, like let's say you do have defective initiation factors, would that lead to an overall stalling of transcription on the genome? So without a ribosome, RNA polymerase pauses very frequently. So with uh, Bryce Nichols and collaborators here at Rutgers University, we have surveyed the E. coli genome for transcriptional pause sites. And we identified 20,000 transcriptional pause sites. So the RNA polymerase on its own will pause nearly every 30 to 60 base pairs. It needs a ribosome to keep pushing it along efficiently. Without the ribosome, transcription is much less efficient, much more pause and arrest power. Thank you. Hi, Richard. This is Masayori. Hi, Masayori. Uh, I just wonder, RNA chaperone have any role in in this? So the if you look here, I'm, I'm pointing to the lower left uh, quadrant of the slide. And if you look in the lower left quadrant, in TTCB, there is this segment of RNA that is exposed to solvent between RNA polymerase and the entrance portal of the ribosome. This segment of RNA is interacting electrostatically with the ribosomal protein S3 on the surface of the 30S subunit of the ribosome. But one face of this RNA is fully exposed to solvent. Any factor that is capable of interacting with that exposed face of RNA potentially can engage this complex and affect this complex. And so we have no specific information for RNA chaperones, but if an RNA chaperone or if any other factor seeks to engage this complex, this is the only point in which the RNA is exposed to solve. The, and Richard, you, is, that, is that not the case in the, uh, in the complex that has both NOS A and NOS G? Uh, so good question. So in a complex that has just NOS G, this is freely exposed to solvent. In a complex that has NUS G and NUS A, this is partly protected, but still substantially exposed. And the reason it's still substantially exposed is that NUS G has this remarkable open structure, this open box-like structure. And so there are very large solvent channels through uh, NUS A. Sorry, so, Masiori. Yeah, so even when NUS A is present, there are these enormous solvent channels that are better seen in the images at right that would allow access to at least part of that RNA. Yeah, my question is, the when deleting the uh, CSPA homolog, four of those, the translation, the cell growth is stopped at low temperature. So at this low temperature, RNA chaperone seems to be very important. Mm -hmm. Yes, and so the, the, the issue is where is the RNA chaperone working? And for a protein encoding gene, of course, only for protein encoding gene, for a protein encoding gene, this is what we believe is the normal state of the protein encoding gene, this at left or this at right, so with or without NUSA. And if the chaperones are engaging 
the RNA in the transcription translation complex. This is the one place, the only place at which they could be doing that. Thank you. Well, I, I think, are there any further questions for Richard, please? Yeah, I'd like to ask uh, whether uh, TTCA has any function. This is unclear. And so we want very much to know where TT we want to know very much whether TTCA occurs in living cells or not. And we want to know if it occurs, where does it occur and under what conditions does it occur? And so everything we see about TTCA indicates it's an inactive complex. It's formed on collisions. Uh, but there is a robust interface between RNA polymerase and the ribosome that suggests this could well be a complex that forms under certain circumstances and has a specific role. So we want very much to use the molecular biology approaches that I summarized on the preceding slide that will allow us to ask whether TTCA occurs in living cells, whether the interactions in TTCA are important for transcription under any circumstances, whether they're important for translation under any circumstances, and if so, what circumstances are those? And what we expect we will find is that in certain genes under certain circumstances, TTCA is formed. To follow on that, does any mechanism suggest itself for rescue of TTCA and conversion of TTCA into TTCB? It, it could only happen by RNA polymerase restarting and moving away from the ribosome. As soon as RNA polymerase moves just a handful of codons farther from the ribosome, you now can switch from TTCA to TCCB. So the conversion would be reactivating RNA polymerase to move relative to the ribosome. Uh, Richard, Greg Critchlow from RCSB PDB asks, does the ribosome bring NUSG to the RNA P to push it, or does it diffuse in after TCCB is formed? This is unclear. So we know that we know that NUS A, the factor shown in light blue, we know that NUS A joins a transcription or elongation complex early on a gene. And we know that NUS G typically joins later on a gene. The exact sequence of events of how TTCB is formed from the individual components remains unclear. Thank you. Uh, Bryce Nichols, I believe you've had your hand raised for a while. Thank you, Jason. Yeah, Richard, just to clarify about this whole thing where the spacer or the linker is unprotected or solvent accessible. So yes. wouldn't that preclude doing any, uh, would make footprinting difficult? I, I was under the impression that it was protected. Okay, well, so this is going to depend. I, this is going to depend on the size of the footprinting agent relative to the size of NUS A. In mm -hmm. the complex that would have just NUS G, there would be accessibility across much of this surface to essentially any reagent. In the complex that also has NUS A, a larger reagent will not be able to pass through the solvent channels I mentioned and access the, the RNA. Okay, or, okay. Uh, the other question I had was with regard to the alpha, were you implying that there were distinct interactions with alpha one and alpha two or just that, I, I was confused if you, Two you, different you, parts of NUS-A interact simultaneously with alpha-CTD1 and alpha-CTD2. So if you okay, just so, look at the right-hand portion of this slide, you'll see alpha-CTD1 is interacting with what's called AR2 domain of NUS-A, whereas alpha-CTD2 is interacting with the S and N domains of NUS-A. So NUS-A is interacting simultaneously with the two alpha-CTDs using two different parts of NUS-A. And there's no interchange between those, Never. like one and two. No. Okay, so you no. can't. Okay. okay. So I think we should Richard. draw this. Okay, go ahead. Uh, so, sorry, I just want a quick question for Richard. Um, can you comment a little bit about how the translation translation coupling might happen uh, at the boundaries of genes on mRNA operons? So, so where once the polymerase has trans traversed to the second gene on an operon, the ribosome has to dissociate. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so I'm wondering as to how uh, does the coupling, is the coupling lost and new coupling? Um, so, 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 yeah, so if in a transcriptional unit that has multiple uh, coding sequences, if at the end of one coding sequence, a ribosome is released 
and a new ribosome must re-enter for the next coding sequence. There would be a period of vulnerability of the complex in which the transcription elongation complex is likely to move more slowly, likely to pause more frequently, and the NUS GC terminal domain is available potentially to recruit a new ribosome, but alternatively to recruit the transcription termination factor rho and terminate transcription. So uh, if there is a ribosome release, there is a moment of vulnerability. Either a new ribosome gets recruited by NUSG or termination factor gets recruited by NUSG. Thank you very much, Richard. That was a tour de force. And I congratulate you and, uh, and your team uh, for uh, this uh, landmark achievement. It's, uh, it's only it's possible incredible. because of the cryo-EM, cryo-ET facility here at Rutgers. Uh, analyzing a series of structures, not just a structure, but a series of structures over seven different scaffolds with different combinations of factors that can only be done if one has in-house a screening microscope and a talented staff assisting with the screening process to get quick readout on what complexes are formed and then can be moved elsewhere for high resolution analysis. Thank you for that plug for the um cryo-electron microscopy and nanoimaging facility uh, is run by uh, Jason Kelber here at uh, in the basement of the uh, the Institute building.